On this episode of Inside KU, see how hands-on classwork for some students equals innovation for major companies. We'll travel to Boston to see how KU is redefining education in our elementary schools and see how the university hopes to address a growing shortage of doctors in rural Kansas. All that and more in this edition of Inside KU. Welcome to Inside KU, an in-depth look at some of the amazing things going on at the University of Kansas. Some of them you can see by simply walking around parts of campus, like here at the Center for Design Research. This building was designed and built by KU students as part of a class project. We'll talk more about this building and what goes on here a little bit later. First, the University of Kansas is home to a new national program devoted to changing the way we educate our children. It's called SWIFT. School-Wide Integrated Framework for Transformation and is funded by the U.S. Department of Education. Developed here at KU, SWIFT takes a brand new inclusive approach to teaching kids in kindergarten through eighth grade and is now being implemented in five different states in the U.S. The Henderson Inclusion School motto is we're better together and we truly are better together. We're better together as instructors. Uh, we're better together as administrators and staff working together. And when I say staff, I don't just mean teachers, I mean cafeteria personnel, school secretary, custodian, all working to support students. We started off as 35% proficiency as a class. Mm -hmm. By interim four, we were at 74%. And I think that goes to our focus on individualizing our instruction. So the huge gains that they made wow. in, in this particular standard was amazing. If you're on the payroll of a school, what is your role in the teaching learning process? And uh, because what we're trying to do is build a culture of learning. Last year we all met and we had this big mm, yeah. <laughs> lovely moment time. meeting. Moment of, uh, <laughs> we'll call it a moment where we all kind of embraced each other in the, the big shift of fractions. And so this year, um, when Amy came up to third, she kind of looked at second grade uh, fractions versus third grade fractions, and it's huge. The, one of the biggest leaps in the Common Core. It's just so huge. Um, so we were very proactive regarding that and we're really impressed with fractions on a number line. Our kids got 85%, which is huge because last year on the ANET they were in like the 40s. All means all is a big concept. It's sort of our mantra, if you will. Um, it means that, that all of the kids at the school are engaged with the curriculum and all of the kids at the school are integrated so that we don't have kids in often special classrooms that are disconnected from the curriculum whether it's for language problems or for reasons of disability or for giftedness. There are a lot of students in our class who are sometimes reluctant to try new things, but the way that you kind of present that information to them makes it a lot easier for them to want to jump in and join in the work. We survey the teachers to see, you know, what the climate of the school is from their perspective. It's off the charts. Um, the kids' test scores are going off the charts. And uh, so it's a... Uh, uh, this is an, a transformational process that takes time, but it's one that's well worth the effort. Fabulous. Thank you. For more information about the SWIFT program, go to swiftschools.org. Coming up next, we'll talk more with the co-creators of the program to find out what's next. Welcome back to Inside KU. We just told you a little bit about the SWIFT Center here at KU and how professors and doctoral students there are working on creating a brand new way to educate children in America. I'm here with Wayne Saylor and Amy McCart, the co-creators of SWIFT. SWIFT focuses on including kids of all abilities in one classroom rather than separating them out. How do you feel this is a better approach than the current way we educate our children? What the SWIFT model does is it, it focuses on the entire school. Um, the, the, the main objective is to have all kids connected to the curriculum. Um, right now, many schools have uh, kids with disabilities disconnected from the curriculum and, and the schools suffer as a result because the test scores uh, for the uh, kids with uh, disabilities sags below the, the uh, typical children. The key is to get uh, general education to uh, want to invest in those resources so that their kids can uh, reach their potential. And uh, so our approach to integrating systems of support benefits all kids. This is a real alignment of resources and uh, people are um, very enthusiastic about meeting uh, the needs of all kids in different ways. How do you feel being at a SWIFT school will improve a child's future no matter whether they choose to go on to higher education or not? Well, we have plenty of data to support 
uh, what we're doing. We've been engaging in this kind of research work now for about 10 years. You know, over the course of, of that period of time, uh, we were able to show that if these pieces are put into place, uh, integrating all of these systems of support so all kids can benefit from what we're, we call inclusive education, um, that uh, uh, we see dramatic increases in measured academic achievement on the part of all kids. Right now, you guys are focused on kindergarten through eighth grade. Is there a high school model as well? Well, we hope so. Um, right now, we, we have our hands full in, in, in K through eight, but um, we, we have a, a model that um, we're eager to, to, to try out at some point, but um, we'll, we'll stick with what we're doing for now. And for now, what does the future hold then for, for these students and for the program? The ideal situation from our perspective is that, uh, that we'll apply for another five-year stint and, uh, and add new states and more districts and, uh, be, uh, and, and have it become a national movement. Well, it's very exciting, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there's a lot more to come as we see more schools start to participate. Thank you both very much for joining us. Coming up next, find out how KU is trying to encourage more medical students to serve in smaller communities where there's a serious shortage of care. The state of Kansas currently has a shortage of family doctors, especially in rural areas, and it's only getting worse. The University of Kansas is trying to turn that around. Here at KU Med's Wichita campus, they're working hard to encourage more graduates to eventually practice in smaller communities. Hi, Terry. How are you doing today? Good. Dr. Jennifer Bacani McKenney can't go anywhere in Fredonia, Kansas without running into someone she knows. She grew up in this southeast Kansas town of around 2,400 people, then left to go to medical school at KU. After meeting her husband, she had no plans to return. We thought, well, we're going to go somewhere cool. We're going to go, we're going to go to Colorado. We're going to ski every weekend. We're going to go to Montana and hike and everything else, you know. Then something happened. The people of Fredonia changed her mind. Once uh, I got through halfway through residency, I told my mom and my dad that, well, I'm, I don't know if we're going to come to Fredonia. And so all of a sudden then we get, um, <laughs> we get bombarded with all of these letters from people in Fredonia saying, we would love for you to come to Fredonia. We want you to be our doctor here. Maybe take a listen to your heart again. Is that OK? okay. Or should we? That included a letter from Susan John, who is now one of McKenney's patients. Just to let her know that, you know, while everybody knows your business, they also help you in your business. <laughs> John is also the director of Fredonia's Chamber of Commerce and feels the pressure of trying to recruit doctors to a small community. Without local doctors, they run the risk of watching their town wither away. Having young doctors come to our town, it gives us a lot of benefit in potential growth, and that's what we're looking for. John has a lot of competition from other small communities when it comes to recruiting physicians. More than half of Kansas's counties are considered medically underserved. There just aren't enough doctors to go around. We've done a very good job, I think, of trying to encourage physicians going to rural areas. The problem is we just don't have enough to supply the need for the entire state of Kansas. As we've seen decreased tax support for our medical schools is our tuition levels for medical schools has gone up and up and up. And this puts a real burden on our medical students, particularly those medical students who want to go into primary care. Our medical students are very smart. Uh, they can do the math and they can also see what they're going to earn as a primary care physician or the family physician and then the other opportunities and other specialties. KU is currently second in the nation when it comes to the number of graduates going into family medicine and has several programs aimed at addressing the shortage. Two of them are funded by the Kansas legislature. First, full medical school loan reimbursement for 30 students per year who commit to practicing in a rural community. Second, a bridge stipend for seven medical residents per year to help them better connect to the small community they plan to serve. All KU medical students are also required to do a four-week rotation in a rural community during their fourth year of school. I can tell you that every medical student that comes back from their rural rotation says this is the best rotation that they had in medical school. Despite all these efforts, KU will need to keep coming up with recruitment ideas. It's estimated that 20 to 40 Kansas family physicians will retire every year starting now. 
That's a gap not easily filled from graduating classes of around 160 to 190 total medical students. I think that we have a lot of medical students that go to medical school wanting to go to rural areas. Oftentimes they come from rural areas and their goal is to go back. But there is something about medical education. It's oftentimes in larger cities. It's oftentimes in tertiary care centers and large hospitals where we have lots of subspecialists that for various reasons dissuades them from going back to a rural area. McKenney's father is a surgeon in Fredonia and says the future of the regional hospital there depends upon bringing new doctors in to replace those who retire. He says he was thrilled when his daughter decided to come back home. Well, when she came, gave me new life too, you know, and I love working with her. McKenney is also starting to realize just how much the town depends on her. With five doctors in our community, we're already um, busy, busier than we would expect to be. So if you put, if you have more patients out there and less doctors, it's, it's only going to get worse and it's, and unfortunately it's worse for the patients because they'll have to wait longer for their medical care or they may not be seen at all. We can't make that worse. We can't let that happen to people. People she cares for every day in a job she now can't imagine doing anywhere else. I tell every single medical student and every resident that I love what I do today and it's better than anything I even imagined it would be. And that's because of the personal relationships with, with my patients. Up next on Inside KU, we'll meet the Executive Vice Chancellor of KU's Medical Center and talk about some exciting new developments there. Welcome back to Inside KU. Before the break, we told you how KU is trying to encourage more medical students to practice in rural communities. Part of that effort includes making sure there's enough funding for their education. I'm here with Dr. Douglas Gerard, who's the Executive Vice Chancellor of the University of Kansas Medical Center. He's going to talk a little bit more about that as well as some of the other happenings going on here. Dr. Gerard, thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate it very much. First of all, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how KU is asking the state legislature to fund something called the Kansas Health Education Initiative. What is that? You know, there's really multiple components to this uh, request to address multiple issues. One is just the rapidly changing medical environment, which really is changing how we need to train our providers, doctors, nurses, and other health professionals. Uh, historically, we've trained them very much in silos school of medicine, school of nursing, and others, and then we graduate them, and then we all throw them in a hospital and say, hey, we want you to work together as a team. So part of it is that medical and, and just health education as a whole is moving towards inter interprofessional education, so really training all these folks in the same environment as opposed to separate environments. Part of the other part of the initiative is to expand the number of doctors that we can train for the state of Kansas, and that's really twofold. Again, one is a facilities issue here on the Kansas City campus with a new health education facility that will help us address both the interprofessional education piece, but also expand our class size so we can really get a larger number of doctors coming through. And then the other is to address our, uh, or to expand our campus in Wichita. We have a four-year campus in Wichita. Uh, we moved it to four years to expand the class size about three years ago. Uh, but we really need to continue to grow that campus there, and that would really help us also expand the number of doctors that we can train for the state. So there's really multiple components to that. Sure. And once the students graduate with their medical degrees, the next challenge is finding enough residency positions for all those students. How is KU dealing with that? You know, that's, that's a very good point and, and something that people don't realize. You can't just graduate from medical school and go put your shingle out somewhere. It really doesn't work that way. You then have to go into your to graduate medical education, what we call it. And so residency training, and that used to be an internship, then an internship plus additional training. Now it's pretty much everybody does a residency of some type. And that uh, is a bigger problem because that's really a federal problem in large part. Uh, the federal government has funded those historically but froze those numbers in the mid-1990s. And so uh, we really have not had any federal expansion of that program since that period of time. We have slowly grown the numbers in the state of Kansas, uh, working very closely with our hospital partners that, that have funded that, to be honest with you, uh, through clinical revenues in the hospitals. But now that's becoming a bit of a challenge as well. And while we've been able to grow that a little bit, we have not been able to keep pace with what we need to do to expand, for example, the class size of the medical school. So that continues to be a problem, and we, we are exploring options with the state to see how they might help us address that, again, specifically for the state of Kansas. Well, KU has become a national re leader in several key research areas. One that a lot of us know about is the National Cancer Institute designation. What's next for the Cancer Center and some of the other research you guys are doing? 
Well, and that was uh, a big accomplishment for us, the state and the region, was to get the NCI designation or National Cancer Institute designation for our cancer center. And that's actually a research designation. Not everybody realizes that. But that really is a designation that allows us to uh, participate in and contribute to uh, clinical trials, bringing the latest cutting edge treatments of cancer to the region. That's the first step. The second step is to become a comprehensive cancer designated, uh, uh, cancer center designation. And that is uh, broader and deeper in all those regards. Also have a, a, a more robust program around addressing the state, issues out across the state and prevention of cancer, diagnosis of cancer and treatment of cancer. So that's our big effort right now is over the next couple of years is to get everything in place as we go up for renewal of our NCI, we'd like to go up to become a comprehensive cancer center designation designation and bring further uh, cutting-edge therapies to the state. We have a lot of other research that goes on in this campus as well. Neurosciences is certainly one area of tremendous strength for us. We have one of only 29 Alzheimer's disease centers, NIH designated, uh, in the region. Tremendous uh, other programs around uh, Parkinson's, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis. The whole neuroscience area for us is rapidly growing. Stroke treatment, uh, et cetera, uh, has really gone well. And we really are the only translational science center for the region that's NIH designated. We have what's called a CTSA or a Clinical Translational Science Award. It's a grant specifically to build the infrastructure for taking those discoveries out of the lab and moving them through the process to get them actually into the hospital, into the patient, and into the clinics. And uh, within the state of Kansas and the greater Kansas City area, we have the only program for that, which is rapidly growing. And, and through a tremendous partnership, not only across the state, but again, partners on the Missouri side as well. Well, it sounds like there's always something new and exciting on the horizon here. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Gerard. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the opportunity need to be here. No problem. Coming up next on Inside KU, we'll show you how a group of KU students are helping design real smart technology products for real companies. At KU Center for Design Research, students are hard at work designing and improving smart technology and consumer products like this gear shifter for Ford, a hands-on education that gives them a jump start in their careers before they graduate. The reason they want to do this is to open up this landscape right. that's here. We're thinking now something kind of integrated with the start button. The thing I like the most is that we're actually working for real clients. Like we're not, we're not doing invented projects for people that don't exist. We're working with real people, presenting to real people, and we have you know, actual deadlines, and um, we're doing projects that matter. They're inventing things, they're developing things that you are going to be using in the next couple of years. The goal of this project was to really take what this object is doing, which is their current shifter, and try and uh, design a more compact package for it um, to free up some space in the console and the car. If we only have one location that we can incorporate all that in. I almost have to move your better. hand. Yeah, you're just moving uh, half an inch to designate what you need. Right. We started looking into different ideas, whether it's Kind of like a miniaturized shrunk down version of that. This one hit start, it would roll these buttons out along the side. And every project starts with like a kickoff by the sponsoring company and they'll come and um, kind of set out their expectations and goals for the semester and then from there we just jump straight into research. The students working here are working on very unique projects. There's some projects that basically our industry sponsors are scratching their head and, and can't figure out themselves. So what we do, we work away from the companies. We have no baggage that we have to carry. We're completely independent. So some of those things that might um, constrict them when they're thinking about things, even in their own R&D labs, we don't have that kind of thing to deal with. We worked with Bayer Healthcare on a new generation of glucometers and diabetes management, specifically dealing with in-car driving. The issue is that most people who are diabetic have issues um, with keeping uh, consciousness while driving. They may have low blood sugar or high blood sugar, so they need a way that they can safely test while being in the car. Would it be focusing on the time or the level of their glucose? Yeah. You know, we discuss that a lot. Um, Which one do they what need to be reminded explain? of? Well, I think it's kind of a combination yeah, of both, both of these. So can either raise or lower with all of these different things, talking about, like you said, food and exercise and maybe the high stress level they have that day. All of those things are gonna throw factors into 
this bar system. Being here is basically working at a professional design firm. You're able to gain access to all of these different tools, technology we have, and the access to these different industry sponsors that have designers we're able to talk to as well as gaining experience talking with them in a professional format. We're having to consider not only what it looks like, but how it works, how the people using it are going to you know, perceive it and imagine you know, how they are going to use it in their everyday lives and kind of take all of that in, into consideration and try and create a, create a product out of it. Is there an audible component? Mm -hmm. The issue with audible is discretion for someone. You don't want either loud beeping or saying, hey, you're diabetic in the middle of a restaurant. Oh, you mean it's in pub when it's in public? Possibly, okay. yeah. Maybe there's a headphone jack. It's really about the mission that, well, of the CDR, providing the the resources to create um, new technologies and for developing new products and services for consumers, for, for anybody. So I think uh, it, it's really having the opportunity to do those things that you've been thinking about and providing you the help to be able to you, for you to do it. I definitely feel prepared. Um, this is, this and along with internships is like, it's, I feel like I'm in the you know, real design workplace already. I'm not worried trying to find a job. Along with designing all these new products, students here at the CDR also had the chance to design one of the buildings they actually work in. This is the Studio 804 building, named after the class that built it. It includes this massive green wall made out of thousands of ferns. The 804 building was a year-long class project built in 2011. It was done by our fifth-year architecture students in Studio 804. That building was designed and built by them by, in, by scratch and in a record time of about seven months. We took advantage of the uniqueness of the location, which is right on Bob Billings Parkway and everybody drives by and it's, it's accessible in terms of just visibility and accessibility but also because we can showcase what we do from the standpoint of sustainability. It provides energy for our electric vehicle charging station, which is right behind the barn, which is the first in the state of Kansas. The wind turbine and photovoltaics and a green roof and, and a special glass that we have in here. And we harvest water off the roof and that's what waters the wall, etc. No matter the path they choose, students and faculty at the University of Kansas are making a big impact they're taking advantage of opportunities that start on the first day of school and go far above the ordinary. I'm Jeannie Hodes, and I hope you've enjoyed this journey inside KU.